Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome back after a year uh, lo year long holiday with my trusty friend and former UKIP member of the European Parliament, Bill Etheridge. How are you doing, Bill? Very well, mate. Very well. How are you? Yeah, all good, all good, all good. Well, I, look, I wanted to do this show to talk about uh, Kwasi Kwarteng. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, the new Chancellor of the Exchequer's uh, budget, which, um, you, you, you know, you're never going to please everybody. Um, but I have to say, from the from what I do professionally, it's definitely, well, from April next year, it's definitely going to benefit me from so IR35 perspective. But um, I wanted to have a quick chat, Bill. You're, you're somebody that uh, that has a little bit of a dealings with regards to the economy. What was your take on Quasi's budget? I was actually amazed, gobsmacked. Um, I'm still, I'm still soaking it in, <laughs> to be honest, because it, I, I, the last thing I expected was a conservative budget, uh, and and this is the right direction of a conservative budget. I think we do have to bear in mind. I'm sure we'll discuss that this is coming after decades of every party, every government putting in social democrat budgets. Um, so it's a step in the right direction, but but I must say, and I've I dip my cap, I thought Liz Truss was just talking the talk in the leadership election. I didn't think for one second that she would genuinely take any kind of conservative steps. And, uh, you know, fair play. I, I, am, I am impressed as a first step, and I, I reserve judgment as to see what comes next. I, I, I know, I... I... I mean, I don't know about you. Once uh, Boris um, resigned and then the leadership election uh, began for the Conservative Party, I, I was quite um, I was quite pessimistic, shall we say, because as we know, you, you, you had some of the new new blood into the Conservative Party. For me, my favourite was Kemi Badenoch. I thought she was absolutely superb. And every time she opened her mouth, it, 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 I, you know, it, it was a, it was in line with how I see things. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. When it was down to the last two, um, the the uh, Gishy Rishi, as I, I saw the Daily Star call him, I don't quite uh, know what that was all about, but um, <laughs> Rishi Sunak, the billionaire, and Liz Truss. I mean, in politically, Liz Truss. I suppose you could say this for Rishi as well. Liz Truss is fairly new to politics. She was only elected in 2010, I believe. Uh, you know, so quite a meteor, you know, meteoric rise. But I wasn't convinced that there was a conservative in the last two. But, you know, she's made massive changes, I think, from a personnel perspective within the Treasury. And, uh, you know, I'm quite interested to understand a bit more about why why that is, because she was a minister for four years, I think, in the Treasury. So she would yeah. have had a good insight into how they work or maybe how they don't work. The, the one thing from the budget that was missing, I think, though, was fuel duty. What's your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, as I believe it, when she was a minister in the Treasury, she wasn't very popular, which is probably a really good sign. Um, yeah, the, the whole issue with fuel, uh, fuel duty is is one that, that there seems to be some confusion of how to deal with it all. Um, and, and it's the same with energy costs as well. You know, it, it's all about people talking about government intervention to help people pay these things, where I think, as you alluded to there in your question, the best government intervention is to get their hands out of extra taxation and extra costs on these things. It also deals with some of the inflationary problems we're facing. Just slash the tax, slash the tax on these things. You know, uh, I know they've got their ideological green obsessions, but right now we can't afford them. And the best and most radical policy they could have taken, I think, would have been to hack that tax away on fuel. And, and let's bring some sanity to it. The government doesn't need to help us with handouts. The government needs to back off and the markets will, will in their own time, find their level. Which, in essence, is what a conservative government is all about. If I understand conservatism, you know, small government, let you know, let the people, um, you know, f f yeah, let us free to, uh, you know, to, to, to do our thing. It's some, it's certainly something that we've seen conservative governments swing more to the left on. 
you know, they, they've turned into big government. I mean, what, what, what have we had now? 12, we're coming on for what, 12 and a half years of Tory government? You wouldn't think so if you looked at all of the culture wars, all of the, you know, uh, uh, the far left radical encroachment into every institution. Liz Truss has come in and I have to say, I mean, I'm still in shock, to be honest with you. I, I, I'm hoping, is, isn't he doing another mini budget on in November? Have I read that right? Have I heard that right? I, I think there was some talk of it. Yeah, I've not seen it confirmed, but it would be nice if it carried on the same vein. The, 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 the thing you talk about there, those all these years of conservative, conservative in, in brackets, government, um, it's been government by um, focus group and by opinion poll. Yeah. And people like handouts. It, it, it's been proven out over the years. People love this. It's proven that, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, and what the argument hasn't been engaged in or addressed that actually the best thing to do is for the government not to take it in the first place. And the Conservative Party has abdicated its responsibility in having that argument and that discussion. Hence, they've just followed on with Blairism up until this yeah. precise point. Well, we, we've had... So how many prime ministers? Seven prime ministers since Thatcher, I think. Oh, gee, I've lost count. We've had so many in the last five years. That was last month, wasn't it? Well, <laughs> so 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 let's do a let's do a roll call. So we've had Tony Blair. Sorry, correction. We've had John Major. Yeah. Uh, was he a conservative? No. I'm, I'm not feeling it. We had Tony Blair. Then we had Gordon Brown. Then we had David Cameron. Then we had Theresa May. And now we have, sorry, then we have Boris Johnson, not a conservative in uh, since Thatcher uh, at all uh, with regards to the Conservative Party. But now we've got Liz Truss. What, what do you know about her? Do you know much about her? I know that she's risen, as you, you mentioned. Not she's Lib risen. Dem, as about as much as I know. She, she, was, um, she was a Lib Dem in her younger life. Uh, and she was brought up in a, a sort of middle class background and um, brought up to believe in many of the values of the, the Liberal Democrat Party. Uh, she's had something of a conversion, it would seem, over recent years. She was either a very energetic or with a very good publicity team when she was in charge of striking the foreign deals uh, after Brexit. I mean, she, she really did look the part there, whether or not that was a good spin or whether she was oh, really look, credit, where credit's due. She did look good. Yeah. I mean, she, she was, it looked like every other day she was going somewhere and striking a deal. So, so, you know, great respect to that. Uh, but I think she's something of a rookie when it comes to hitting the top job, but maybe that's, that's what we need. What we needed when Mrs. Thatcher hit the top job, she'd not had the experience in the great offices of state. Education had been her highest position. Um, and I think she probably hadn't had time for them to get their hooks into her and tell her what can and can't be done. And, you know, far from comparing Liz Truss to the great lady, but maybe there's a similarity there in that one respect. I, I, I have now, for quite a few years, been very worried about the top of the senior civil service. I would say since, um, I believe it was 200 civil servants uh, top civil servants signed a letter and handed it to Theresa May requesting she um, put forward a, a second referendum on our relationship with the European Union. I think since then that 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 could certainly caught my eye, and I'm wondering now. I mean, we've had again to 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 you know parrot what I said earlier. We've had 12 years of so-called conservative government, and yet we've gone so far left now that you and I do qualify as far right because to all of the far left we can only be far right because we're so far away from them so it, it, I, i'm very concerned now about who the civil service the top of the civil service who they think they actually serve because i, I maybe it's just me maybe i'm just so far down a rabbit hole that i can't get out of it um i mean what's your take on on the civil service, do you think they work for the country? Or, I mean, do you have any worries about them from what you've learned in your time in politics? I think they work for the status quo. Um, and the status quo since um, the coup against Lady Thatcher, and that's what I firmly believe it was, 
well, maybe that's a, a topic for another time. But since then, the status quo has been this pro EU, pro EU um, big state interventionist social democracy, and they are politically motivated. And there's no question that they're politically motivated. As much as they may deny, the, the, the mask doesn't just slip. They, they throw it aside at every possible opportunity. And I think that if Liz Truss really is trying to be a conservative, uh, she's going to really have a battle behind the scenes that would make for, a, you know, would probably make Yes Minister in the thick of it look like child's play compared to what she's going to have to go through. Um, I, I'm concerned that they'll take the wind out of her sails, and I think that they might find lots of things for her to be busy with that will take any radical attempts to embrace real conservatism away and, and thrust her back towards this one-nation conservatism, which is basically socialism. Well, this, this is where you need strong secretaries of states, so you know, to, to help her because she, you know. The, the only person that has real power, the only elected person that has real power in British politics is the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister carries the authority of the monarch, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, she, obviously, in this case, she. She is the only person that can remove a permanent secretary, yeah? A secretary of state cannot remove their permanent secretary. Now, what the reason I'm saying that is it was quite interesting. If you look at the Home Office in the time of Sajid Javid and, and, and then obviously his successor, who then was Pretty Patel, uh, Sir Philip Rutman seemed to obstruct. And I think that's why he banged heads with Pretty Patel. And ultimately, Boris Johnson removed him from his position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, th that's at least how it was reported. I don't know the ins and outs, the intricacies, but but I felt it very that that was a good example. I mean, that was over the rape, um, the grooming gangs, should I, should I say, report. Do you remember that? It, it was yeah. reported in a few of the newspapers. So, yeah, I mean, who, who knows? Let's, you know, it's very early days. She's been in post, what, three weeks now? Well, one or three weeks. <laughs> can, can, I mean, can you, you imagine being, I mean, I've got no brief for her. I, I, I haven't voted Conservative and probably won't, but two or three days into the job and Her Majesty passes away. Yeah. I mean, yeah. how yeah. extraordinary um, to be in that situation and then to put in this uh, controversial budget almost straight afterwards. I mean, whatever we may think of her, she's certainly hit the ground running. And... Uh, yeah. I wouldn't like to have been in her shoes this last couple of weeks, I must say. It, 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 well, I mean, if you're, you know, if you put your put yourself up for it, you, you know, she's 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 had exposure of government frontline work, so you know, now she's in the big job. And I have to say, from what I'm hearing, you know, sorry, not from what I'm hearing, because if if what I'm hearing from the mainstream media, she's a female um, Adolf Adolf. Hitler, German type bloke, yeah. <laughs> but from what I'm seeing, the evidence that I'm seeing from her, and especially quasi, uh, I like, you know, I, lo I like what I'm seeing. It's very early days. It do it doesn't cover all of our economy, but at least it makes some. It look, I'm happy because every time he opened his mouth, it, it benefited me. So I'm completely selfish, you know. It, 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 I, I, I was happy. So if you go back to if you, if we go if we swing it back to the budget, um, I, I'm hoping he's going to bring in some fuel, you know, some relief on on the uh, you know the price of fuel at the pumps in in November. What what do you think the realistic chances of that are? I think that's going to be the subject of an internal battle within that government because there are still going to be elements within the government and certainly within the civil service who are obsessed with the climate change agenda and with the belief or that... Or the way of, that of showing themselves, if you know what I mean, yeah? Um, yeah, so I, 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 I think that too. But, yes, yeah, interesting times, interesting times. What What's your take on the rest of the governmental, uh, um, shall we say, postings? So, for example, Suella, Be Suella Ferdinand, as her name is now, the former Attorney General who has now taken on the Home Secretary role. I mean, that's another one. That's another bag of uh, a bag of hornets is the um, the Home Office. Well, I mean, she she's another one who's always talked a good talk. Uh, and as I recall, I think Nigel backed her in the leadership campaign. Um, but I, I'm gonna, I sound terribly jaded and, and cynical, but I don't believe 
any of these people until I see them in action, until they do what they say they're going to do. I've experienced 20 years of conservatives lying through their teeth well, to get that. position. Um, and, and obviously doing it, you know, just clearly blatantly saying one thing and doing another. So she sounds good, but Pretty Patel sounded good. For one reason or another, it didn't happen. And, you know, the whole concern with all of this is that sound bites don't, don't do anything. They don't make any difference. All they do is win over uh, it's dog whistle politics to try and get your own members and your own supporters to back you. But when it comes down to actually doing it, I mean, for example, with this mini budget, by the way, did they talk to the Bank of England first? Because at the same time <laughs> as, as they're doing this, the Bank of England puts interest rates up. And are they budgeting for growth or, or what? Are they pulling against each other? Now, that could just be naive or it could be someone deliberately trying to undo what they're doing. You know, there's Which a I lot. Believe, I believe it's the latter. Yeah, possibly so. But you'd have thought that the government, I oh, know the Bank of England is supposedly independent, and that's a, another vexed issue because I'm not convinced about that either. But you'd have thought they'd have had some form of communication. And if every time they try and do something, they're going to get... Undermined. Yeah. Then it's, we're going nowhere. And, and that's, yeah. that's my concern. If, if you look at... Um, if you look at uh, so, talk, talking about undermining, you've got the Home Office, you've got the Foreign Office. Um, you, so... Let's look at the uh, the the dinghy divers as uh, a for a for a friend of mine who's now um, shall we say gone on a, a two and a half year holiday somewhere. Um, I, I got this the I got this theory. So hear hear me out, right? So we have we have uh, I think this year I think the I think the numbers around sixty thousand illegal Im immigrants coming over from. Dover, uh, sorry, Calais to Dover, yeah, or, or on boats, um, dinghies, shall we say. They're escorted by the French Navy. They're, they're picked up by our RNLI or the Royal Navy and, and, brought, in, and brought onto our shores, yeah, so, so sometimes. I, I'm, I think Nigel Farage has reported that French naval, naval vessels have moved into, into uh, our waters to help, you know, ferry over boats and stuff like that. That made me think, because I thought, I'm thinking, no no military foreign naval vessel would move into foreign waters unless it had permission to do so, right? It, it just wouldn't get, it just wouldn't do it because war, you know, that's how wars are started. I'm not saying a war would start, but what it got me thinking was that means our home office must be in communication, which obviously it is, uh, but it's the type of communication I'm interested in, with both the EU and the French um, Foreign Office, yeah. To to so th th we're told it's a, it's organised gangs, organised crime gangs doing this. Well, I'm wondering if it's organised governments that are facilitating this because it's almost at sixty thousand people. That's an invasion. Yeah, sixty thousand people coming over and no one can stop it. That do they want to stop it? The Home Office. I don't believe that they do. Um, I think they're, at, or my suspicion, and I can't prove it, but I'm looking at it. Are they facilitating this? And if they are, why would they be? What's your thought? Well, I've been round the camps in Calais back when I was an MEP. Yeah, I remember um, that. And, and, and done a full tour round and spoke to a lot of the people there. And there, there's no doubt that there is organised crime running it. I mean, they're, oh, yeah, yeah, they're, yeah, yeah. they're, they're there, you, you know, sort of, they're, they're escorting you as you go through. Well, we know it, and the intelligence services don't know it and don't know who's doing it. I'm sorry, I course, find that hard yeah. to believe. I, I think they're working hand in glove. I, I, I think it's, it's quite apparent. I mean, you know, Britain and France are not small, um, puny military powers who yeah. couldn't do something if they wanted to. You're talking about two of the most powerful nations on earth. And these guys coming over on dinghies can break through into another territorial water. Of course, they're being um, supported and helped in doing it. The reasons behind it, well, where there's organised crime, there's money. And I should say now more on that, but just in case we know the fate of people who cast aspersions. But also there is perhaps a degree of politically correct fear that you know oh, if some people get lost in the channel and wash up on one of the coasts it's going to look terrible in the liberal press uh, and, and of course it would look bad and it is bad but 
where do you draw the line? Where you know, if someone insists on taking this risk, how far are you prepared to go to facilitate them before you just start encouraging everyone else to do it? Um, there's a lot more to it than meets the general public's eye. I think is what I feel comfortable yeah, yeah. saying. I, I, I believe this is. I, I, I believe this is not political correctness. I believe this is by design. Um, it, I mean, we've seen an escalation of numbers of people coming over. On a, and it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And you've alluded to it yourself. You've got, um, we're, we're, we're going to have to say England because it's England's shores that, that, that it's coming on to. Um, and they can't stop it. I think they can't stop it because they're encouraging it. They want it. It's not that they don't want it. The politicians want to stop it. Yeah. So yeah. Pretty Patel wanted to stop it. I believe uh, my suspicion is her department undermined her at every turn, every turn. That's that's my suspicion. And I think eventually when she's allowed to speak her mind, maybe five, ten years time, she'll say the same thing. Well, I think it's pretty well documented that there was an issue between her and her department, wasn't there? Um, so I, I think you, you're, you're on to something. The, the civil service are there to serve the government of the day and to enact government policy. Anything else, they should be removed from their positions, straight Absolutely. away removed from their positions, en masse if need be, you know, because they're turning our, our country. You know, we are their bosses. We're the taxpayers. Their big, hefty salaries and their big, lovely, gilded pensions. You know, I'm not saying it's all of them. I'm sure there are good, decent civil servants. But unfortunately, the, the, the flavour of the way the country has gone in the last decade to 15 years is not down to the Conservative Party. It's that, I mean, they have to take the heat for it because they've been too lily-livered to even see it, yeah? yeah. It's, but we, we are now in a very mild version of North Korea because, I believe, of our ultra-left-wing civil service. Have, have I gone mad? No, because a, a good example of it is when uh, I went to Washington shortly after uh, Trump had been elected, and there were departments there, swathes of empty desks, because people who weren't playing ball, people who were considered not to be doing the job in the you know, in neutral manner or, or, or were being obstructive, was just got rid of. And, and actually, he went so far with it that they were starting to find it difficult to operate because he just got rid of them. Good. Uh, and, and if you want to, yeah, and if you want to make change, you know, you've got to crack a few eggs, and and, and he clearly did. Um, whereas that doesn't happen here, uh, and and that's why the civil service maintains this 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 sort of control, this damp blanket across everything, and stops change happening. Yeah, yeah. I, again, I want to reiterate. It's not all of the civil service by a long shot. Unfortunately, it's enough at the top that, that are directing this country in a direction that I don't recognise. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, that we've got a prime minister. Again, it's only three weeks in. It's very early days. Um, you know, and I'm, I, for me, so far, I'm chuffed with the budget. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happy with it. I'm happy that she's removed people that she is entitled to do as prime minister because obviously they weren't doing, you know, what was required by the elected officials, you know, people that I did vote conservative because I didn't want Jeremy Corbyn to get in. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. It, it, it turns out it what have been. Um, but uh, the one thing I will say about the budget is that one of the criticisms that have been thrown up throw at it is that it benefits the rich over the poor and it's true that the way that some of the cuts have been made aren't the best way to benefit those at the bottom of the earnings scale however bear in mind we are in an inflationary cycle if you're going to cut taxes in this period of the cycle it's probably better to cut it for those at the top because they will probably probably because it's not an exact science invest it they will probably put it into businesses they will probably save it on, on that it, note, on that note and i just want to throw this in there while you're in your flow uh, bankers um caps being removed i'm not sure what i think of that okay well i'll come to that but what i was about to say is if you give it to uh, puts tax cuts to the people at the bottom which is something i always campaign for and always but still do believe in but if you do do that you know very well what's going to happen they're going to spend it 
Of course they are. And that's going to increase inflation. So there is some logic to the way it's being applied. As regards removing the caps on, on bankers' earnings, bonuses rather, um, being somewhat on the libertarian side of the scale, I don't care how much anyone earns. As long as their company is doing well uh, and it's a, a justified bonus that the company decides to give them, they could have a billion pounds for me. I just don't care. I believe in letting the market take its course. If they're no good and the company gives them that much money, it'll go bust. So I don't believe in capping wages on anyone. I take your point, and from my limited understanding of how the banking sector and that work, um, I mean, you, you said you, you said a key sentence, if they are doing well. Well, they weren't doing well in 2008. Yeah, they run us into the ground. You know, the world economy crashed. And, and stop me if I'm wrong, I don't believe a single banker was prosecuted. Correct. But if Gordon Brown hadn't bailed them out, their companies would have gone bust. Well, I mean, Gordon Brown, wasn't he Chancellor for a decade bef uh, before that crash? But anyway, I just thought I'd drop that in there. Well, you see, this, this, is, this is the thing. State intervention, state intervention allowed that practice to continue. Because if the state had backed off and let it run as a business, and they were giving these huge bonuses and, the, and they went bust, they lose their jobs, they lose their bonuses, they lose everything. When the state comes in with our money... To, to sort them all out. Well, well, you know, why should why should they behave like that? You know, they've got a, a guaranteed safety net. So, where, so from our the UK economy perspective uh, and your understanding, where do you think we'll be in the next twelve months? I think there's a strong danger still of inflation becoming very very serious, driven by fuel and energy. Uh, I think that's that's going to have a massively detrimental effect. I think that the government has got to do something. I prefer it to, as we discussed before, to back off on the taxes. But if that continues, the cost of living crisis continues, there will be a knock-on effect. And as far as I'm concerned, what follows inflation is almost always deep recession. Um, so, And that recession with the job losses could well be biting at the time of the next election. So they've got to think really seriously about how they pan this out now. They are at a pivotal moment, and in a way, I'm glad they're doing radical stuff now to get it out of the way. Lifting the fracking bans a really good move. Absolutely. Get it done before the election so that at election time you can point to the benefits rather than the controversy. So in that sense, I can see exactly what they're doing. You, you always need to do it two or three years before the election to allow the effect to come through. The, the only threat that I see with that is... Um, I was going to say in essence, but it's not in essence. We we now have a truss conservative government that's clearing up the mess from previous conservative governments. So it, it's kind of the robber, you, you know, um, investigating his own crime. If if you if you get my point politically, if yeah. you look at the polling now. Um, which I, I mean, but I don't believe polls anyway. But I've had it said to me so many times. I thought I'd bring it up. You know, if there was a general election tomorrow, these polls would suggest that um, a party that cannot even describe what a woman is, the Labour Party, would be in government. If not, they would be in government propped up by the fascistic uh, uh, SNP. What's your thoughts on that? I think it's coming to that time where people get fed up and look for a change anyway. So I think in, in order to actually stand a chance of the election, the Conservatives have got to do something really different. That's why... I, I thought um, I was backing the same lady as you for the leadership because I thought she would be so Can different be, yeah. in her approach that, that people would feel like the government had already changed. I think Liz Truss is obviously doing something right because all the attacks on her at the moment are she's stupid. Now, if someone attacks someone for being stupid, it means you can't argue with actually what they're putting oh. forward. Yeah, And so I, I think that she's doing something right, but she has to have the strength to really push hard these next six to 12 months, really get stuck into it. And, you know, cynical ex-politician, as I may sound, I think if she really puts in the, the painful miles now with changes, she can portray herself as the fresh person who's, who's put things right at the next election with a, an economy that's looking better. And people have got really short memories. 
And they won't remember what's happened the decade before. They'll just think, oh, great, you know, we've got Maggie Mark too. And, and, and she'll, she'll possibly win. If she doesn't, they'll certainly lose. Right. I'm, I'm going to, uh, uh, if I start coming up in scabies and everything else, it's because, uh, just, just bear with me. There is a positive to Labour winning the next general election. In their conference, and uh, you know they're after PR now, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I saw them say that. I don't believe them. Uh, well, it's actually, it's actually been so. The the uh, NFU union voted f uh, for it overwhelmingly as well. Yeah, that really surprised me. And mm -hmm. one of the unions did, and for love nor money, one of the other unions for love nor money. I can't remember who it was. My mind's just gone blank. So I think there is a real push for. Uh, PR now. I, I think that's because they got such a kick in in the last general election that they, they, mm. that they I think they, they're beginning to realise that they don't identify with with any voter base really anymore. You know, they're, they're gender confused. Um, that, you know, they can they have a real problem with anti-Semitism as the Metropolitan Police uh, confirmed. Um, yeah. One of their stalwarts, I know he's not in the Labour Party now because of Sir Keir Starmer, but Jeremy Corbyn, do you see his comments made about the national anthem being sung at the Labour conference? I don't know if you've seen that. I'm guessing he wasn't impressed. No, he wasn't impressed at all. He said, oh, I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I'll, I'll find a, I'll get a YouTube link to it. And add it into the details of this, but you, you know, you're thinking these people just don't understand Britain at all. I, I you know, um, nothing they've got on offer. It's all false promises. Oh, Sir Keir Starmer says that um, we'll we'll hit net zero in six years after getting in government. Well, how are you going to fund that? How am I going to fund that? How is the working class person going to be able to fund that? I mean, it's just all pie in the sky promises, but. Um, the PR bit did interest me. I think they've got some real, um, I think they've got their teeth into it. I don't understand fully why they have the Labour Party, but they've got their teeth into it. So it may not all be doom and gloom. Maybe, but I think you tend to find that parties that are in opposition are always really keen on PR. And then parties that get into government suddenly go off it because they've, they've realised they've won during that using the first past the post and turkeys don't tend to vote for Christmas. So um, I'm... I'm I'm sure they've passed the motions, and I'm sure that the way it stands at the moment, they would seem bound to it. I'm also sure that if they won a 50 or 60 seat majority first past the post the next election, oh, they probably wouldn't find time in the uh, in their agenda to fit it in. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Well, well, Bill, it's been fun. So I want to finish off by you telling everyone what you've been doing. Well, I've been developing a charity called Support Futures uh, and what we do is we run programs for mental and physical health helping people giving them free uh, coaching on both things uh, people who wouldn't maybe be able to afford it normally and we pay for that through organizing events darts exhibitions nights with famous footballers sportsmen etc etc uh, it's really challenging but great fun and anyone who's interested in it please look me up on my Facebook page and you'll see all about what we're doing uh, and it's really making a difference in the community, and it's great fun, but it's also hard work, as you can probably tell from how exhausted I look at the moment. <laughs> no, no, you're doing well. I, like I say, I, I follow it on uh, follow you on uh, social media, and I can see some of the stuff that you're doing, and you're getting some good names. I'm coming to one of your events in November where you've got uh, any – is it an evening with Letizia? An or evening with Matt Letizia. Yes, I, I, shall, I shall be uh, – uh, chairman of a uh, host of proceedings asking uh, Mr. Letizia some non-controversial questions, as you can imagine. <laughs> yes, and I'm sure he'll give you some non-controversial answers. I, <laughs> I, lo I love Matt Letizia. We need no we need more people like him, you know, uh, critical thinkers that are willing to put their neck on the line because they know something isn't right. But anyway, Bill, thank you so much for your time, my good friend. Cheers, and man. I will, uh, you know, our paths will cross for a drop of the amber nectar in the very near future. Everybody, thank you so much for uh, watching and listening to our rant. And uh, come back, and uh, we'll be, there'll be more shows when I can be bothered to uh, <laughs> to organise them. Thanks a lot, Bill. Cheers.